I would like to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome Dr. Tony Knight to join us today. Dr. Knight's the superintendent of the Oak Park Unified School District and is an adjunct professor of education at the University of Southern California School of Education. He served as a public school teacher and administrator for 42 years and is retiring at the end of this month after an amazing career in education. Under Dr. Knight's leadership, Oak Park Unified School District was named um, the first US Green, Green Ribbon School in, in California and one of a handful in the nation recognized for commitment to environmental education and sustainability practices. And their work is absolutely phenomenal. Tony's been collaborating with the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative over the last year and he participated in our policy working group. And I'm a great admirer and big fan of, of your work, Tony, and uh, we're honored to have you join us here today. So please, well, please join me in welcoming Tony. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Let me share my screen and we'll talk further here. Let's see. All right, are we all seeing that? Yes, okay, good, good. So, you know, there's a lot to focus on. I've done bigger presentations, obviously, for many hours on these topics. So I tried to, you know, condense this to some of the things that are the most relevant to the National Outdoor Learning Initiative and the things we've been through this year and things that could be useful to you. But you can always contact me to find out more about some of these things. Um, if you're interested in a specific element of it um, as we go forward. I wanted to start by thanking Sharon and also thanking Yalda. I mean, I was so inspired when I visited the Golestan School that I would recommend everybody on this call. If you have the opportunity, if you're in the Bay Area and you're able to indulge this, to, uh, Yalda, to, but to go and see her school because it's really a beautiful place, not just visually, but um, uh, pedagogically, I think that's the most, that was the key element that I felt was important to explain some of these things to people, you know, why you want to have them, you know, and then talk about, you know, how this impacts education for children. So yeah, absolutely great place. And, um, you know, highly recommend visiting there. There we go. So yeah, as, as uh, Sharon mentioned, we've been doing some, some big work with uh, environmental education and practices. And um, one of our district goals is to, for example, is to deepen student learning through nature-based experiences, environmental stewardship, and to see this in all the different areas of, of instruction. And to promote, and in the process of this, by promoting project and nature-based learning, and then increasing, you know, structured and unstructured activities that's both the school and on field trips, getting kids out of the school environment. So um, it, it's kind of a multi-dimensional. And we've, we've made this commitment that authentic sustainability uh, education will be interwoven into all the aspects of teaching and learning throughout the school district, and that we would work to inspire global stewardship. And so we kind of connected ourselves. One of the things that we did is that we, we, we connected ourselves to the UN sustainable, sustainable and sustainability and development goals, which I recommend, by the way, looking at at least, you know, looking at the 17 goals, they're a, they're a really nice guidepost, if you will. To, to center things around. And, and because sometimes you will be criticized for being you know, a green school, these areas of the sustainable development goals go into, into social justice areas, um, other kinds of areas, they transcend different things and not just related to the environment, if that's not enough already, but they go into different areas. And I think it's a, we found it to be a really good area to look at. The other framework is the, uh, in California, we have the environmental principles and concepts. So they're called the EPs and Cs. And in California, these have to be integrated into textbooks and instructional materials that the state might adopt. And uh, these have been, uh, uh, you know, the, as things come out, these are there. And in fact, they're now connected to the state testing system. So the, the state, California has a standards-based testing system based on the common core uh, standards. And now these EPNCs are integrated into the state testing. So that's a great selling point for school boards and administrators and other people who might be reluctant, you know, uh, and teachers that, you know, this is kind of something that we have to do. It's important that we do it and we need to do it well. So practice makes perfect, we say. So these are the practices that I was talking about. Some of the things is in 2017, we went all solar at all of our schools so that 85% of our power is, uh, is generated from solar energy. Uh, we bought the systems. We spent about $7 million for our schools. Our school district has about 4,300 students on six campuses. 
And so, uh, and the way you have to do it, there's a whole thing, we could just talk three hours on solar energy, but you have to do it school by school in a big system like this. And we bought the systems rather than doing a lease or um, some kind of a power purchase agreement, et cetera. We just bought them with bond money. And so, but this is saving the district now about $500,000 a year in general fund money. And we're gonna be budgeting that money, for example, to pay for technology, uh, which is sort of a disposable thing that is that you don't like to use bond money for because it goes, you go through it kind of quickly. So this is kind of a renewable source of, of, of money that comes from a renewable source of energy, saving the district money. Public school systems in California use a lot of electricity for air conditioning, especially where we're located. We're located between LA and Santa Barbara, inland about 15 miles from the sea. Um, so it's, the climate is beautiful, but it gets really hot here from, you know, for most of the year. I mean, it's hot from, from August all the way, when school starts here on August the 9th for us, and it's hot until the winter, and then it starts getting hot in the May, May again. And it's, you know, the air conditioners run constantly. Anyway, other things like, we found grants for EV charging stations, using bioswales to deal with rainwater. The best examples to see bioswales, by the way, are San Francisco Unified. Sharon showed me some up there. And we've implemented those a lot of our schools that capture all your rainwater and don't let it fall and roll into the streets. I'm gonna talk about the classrooms made out of recycled shipping containers in a second, cool roofs, 100% LED lighting, big recycling programs, and then no more use of rodenticides, pesticides, and then 100% organic landscaping. And just before this call today, I found out that we're changing contracts with our mowing company that is going to be using all electric machinery, all electric mowers and blowers and everything, which is a lot because we probably have 70 acres of land that's, uh, and a lot of it is turf for athletic fields, et cetera. Those are big expenses and big energy consumers for public school districts. And then our food choices, we have a plant forward menu, pretty innovative our menu is. We, we don't serve any meat except some chicken. Um, most of it's a plant forward and the reason for that are for health reasons and for connection to the environment and uh, sustainability reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an example of one of our schools. This is our middle school. And these are the solar arrays that we put there. We place them on the athletic fields area here so that these are wonderful areas for the kids to recreate in uh, uh, when it's hot in the shade and to watch games, et cetera. So it's kind of neat. Our area is in this wildland urban interface, as you can see. And if you see that line on the hillside, that's where the Woolsey fire came here. It burned 40 homes in our community. And you can see where the fire line, where it stopped in some areas, but the area is very fire prone and um, a, a victim of climate change, if you will, like a lot of, like most areas. So we made a concerted effort, for example, to plant trees. We have, we keep a count of them um, we have over 950 on six campuses, and every one of them has a special plan for care and making sure that they are in good shape. And we plant California natives when possible. These are native sycamore trees, for example. We get kids outside. And by the way, today is World Oceans Day. You probably all knew that, June the 8th. So we do a lot to promote ocean literacy. Um, I took this picture with kids on a whale watch, uh, a humpback whale. And we go way out at sea, we take them out to the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and National Park. I happen to be on the advisory council for the National Marine Sanctuary and have some connections out there. And um, the kids get out, do whale watching, get out, hike on the islands. Uh, it's a very wonderful outdoor experience for the kids. Uh, we take all of our fifth graders, for example, as part of an integrated unit on the Channel Islands, natural selection, Native American history of the Chumash, whose land we are uh, occupying. Um, etc. And we actually are now bringing a Shumash elder with us on the trips to explain the situation there with the Shumash and how that was the center of their civilization. And it's in, in this situation, the, um, the elder explains that in his words, rather than us trying to uh, explain the story to them, which is uh, the preferred way of doing it. And then I mentioned the sustainable development goals from the United Nations, um, something to look at if you haven't looked at them yet. So these are the modular classrooms I wanted to talk about a little bit. So these are um, made out of, we claim the shipping containers. This is our latest installation at the middle school. If you happen to notice back at that one slide, there was a sand pit that we didn't use anymore. So we turned it into six classrooms. 
And we custom, had these custom designed differently than they originally make them. But these are all, the shipping containers come to the port of Los Angeles from China. Most of them don't go back. They're scrapped here, they're scrap metal. And they, so they've only been, they've been create, made there for one use. And they're one of the most useful tools that we have come up with sort of accidentally in the 21st century. They're very strong. They meet earthquake standards. They're very versatile. They will last more than 50 years or more, depending on how you care for them. Um, we pour a foundation uh, under them and, um, and then set them on top. Three shipping containers makes a 960 square foot classroom. Uh, four makes a 1280. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with them. These are all pre-DSA approved in California. That means they're approved by the division of the state architect. So you don't have to go through too long of a process to get them installed. They cost less than brick and mortar buildings and they are zero, net zero energy buildings. So they use the, they don't use any power or, or uh, they use less than they generate, et cetera. So the type of air conditioning systems we use, uh, they have solar powered uh, arrays on top. These don't have them because we already have them system-wide. So, but our, our initial ones do. And then what we put in these are these um, eight foot wide floor to ceiling doors that uh, accordion doors basically that fold open so that you can have indoor and outdoor space. So the kids can be in there and outdoor, sort of like what you saw at Yalda School, but not as big. You can't go the whole wall because of earthquake requirements in California with these particular buildings, but you can get them, you can do it that way. And then the door next to it is all glass with a store front door to open up. So the rooms are very light and airy inside. This is another uh, uh, installation we did at our high school. And um, these buildings are, I mean, they're just absolutely gorgeous, I think. This one has reflective glass. They reflect the natural environment around it. They sort of disappear. And then in this area, we put a natural landscape um, around it. So, you know, that it would reflect, that's what you would see from inside the classroom. But if you look at this slide, you could go through it, but you can see how much they save a tremendous amount of energy in the construction of them, because we forget how much the construction process uses in terms of um, the environment and how much, what a negative impact it has even when we're building sustainable buildings. So you have to think about what is it made out of? What, how, where is it gonna go? What about all the construction waste, et cetera? And this is what they look like inside. Pretty basic. One of the things that we learned from Yalda School was that like, is to use a lot of natural materials inside as much as possible. So we work with natural pod furniture systems who I recommend in, in Canada, and they custom made all your furniture for you basically. And that's what all this furniture is, except maybe the chairs. I think they were, they don't make chairs. So we bought these that match in. We used the LBT floor like Yalda has in her school that's uh, got a wood veneer basically on it so that it sort of, you know, takes away a little bit from the industrial steel that you're, that you're dealing with, it softens it. And then of course, this is before the classroom was open, but, uh, and then when it opens, uh, you know, the teachers put all kinds of neat things and it becomes a really beautiful place. But you can see how you can open those doors and the kids can work outside and be supervised by the teacher inside. So we're doing a bunch of new elementary school classrooms that are this way. And the teachers are ecstatic about the idea of being able to have some of their kids work outside, some of their kids work inside. Again, this is the idea. I got it directly from the oldest school. And, and what I found is very interesting in working with the architects, we are working with one of the best architectural firms in California or in the nation, Harley Ellis Devro, but they weren't really clear on this concept. I had to explain it like a map to them on how this needed to be and then show them pictures of your school, Yalda, before they could get the idea of how we wanted to do this. You know, it was like, it was very difficult to explain because there's not a lot of this going on, even though every restaurant you go to in LA has a California door and every house has a California room, which is basically this that opens up to the outside. It's new in schools. So you have to ask for it and you have to find examples around. And this is what the area looks like and sort of a panoramic view of it. You know, again, trying to incorporate, um, you know, the native landscape as much as possible, you know, and make it fun for the kids and, um, and, and practical for the teachers to supervise kids while they're teaching. And then this is just creating outdoor learning spaces with what we already have. So we wanted to get kids outside for COVID. So this is in another school. And we just bought a bunch of reclaimed, uh, I mean, uh, picnic tables made out of recycled plastic that are ADA compliant, as you can see and put them underneath shade sails that we were uh, legally allowed to attach to the buildings with proper footings on the, on the extension areas. And now all of a sudden we have an outdoor classroom that teachers can take their kids to. And on this campus, uh, this was featured on NPR recently on a K-12 
KCRW, our local station, on how we were doing this here in, in, uh, at our school and, and how the kids could get outside to make it safer for the teachers and the kids during COVID. But guess what? These things aren't going away. They're going to be here next year when we're in full open. And now all of a sudden the teachers say, oh, this was really fun teaching outside. Let's keep doing that. This is an outdoor area that we added at one of our older schools built in the 1960s. Um, we added the shade sails and then we did the school playground into like a natural river area, et cetera. Places like, again, where kids can take risks by jumping off the boulders, et cetera. Again, you have to, as an administrator or a teacher, you have to be able to explain this to people because it won't take five minutes before someone says, someone's gonna get hurt, you know? And, uh, and we say, yeah, they might get hurt, but they're probably not gonna die. And taking risks is part of this. When you go through the whole explaining of this kind of thing, people get it very quickly. And, and, and this has been a very popular uh, playground area for this kindergarten uh, yard at Brookside School. And everybody loves it. And I get zero complaints about it. And, um, and we, don't have, we don't have injuries here any more or less than any place else with children that size. Now, if I was to jump off one of those rocks, I might break something. But a five-year-old, you know, their bones are made out of rubber, so they don't. This is, this is like real basic. Again, if like you have a budget and you've got some old portable classrooms like these, boom, we put these in this year, just like this. And now all of a sudden we got outdoor learning space. Because again, in California, the bigger problem in Southern California, the big problem is the heat and the sun. It only rained five inches here this year. It usually rains 15, but it only rained five. That's kind of the new normal. And so, you know, the shade is what you really have to have because in August, you know, it's really, really hot. So that I found to be a bigger barrier to getting people to kick their kids outside than the, um, than the rain or any other kind of weather. The wind, of course, is a big problem as well here, you know, and sometimes. We just created this space uh, at another school underneath the solar arrays, because what happens under the solar arrays when they're over the grass is it kills the grass because they don't get enough sunlight. So by, by adding a little concrete pad and then we, put, we shoved all the tables in here, um, you know, it worked perfect for another outdoor learning space at this particular school that doesn't have them built into the classrooms. So that's kind of the other idea is if you can build them next to the classrooms in new construction or in some of the other existing areas, that's better. But if you can't, then creating areas around the campus that are shaded, you know, and you can put tables in for kids to work at or to be at or to be on, et cetera, then, then that's another solution to some of these problems. You know, without a lot of complication, the only cost here was the, was the uh, concrete path. You know, that we were able to put in. So this is another section of this presentation that I'm not going to get into right now because I think it's uh, off focus. But basically, like what we've done here is, you know, looked at how we integrate these things into the curriculum, which again is another hour presentation. But what we've had are teachers who are integrating these concepts at the middle school, the high school, the elementary schools into their lessons and even whole courses at the high school designed around the environment and sustainability beyond the advanced placement environmental science class. You know, so like classes in literature that look at, you know, the history of literature and the environment. And then what's happening is now we're creating social action learning by kids getting all excited and interested in it from what they see at school every day. You know, from the, at the high school, they park their car under the solar panels and they plug it in at the EV station where it's free for students and teachers to, to plug in. And then all of a sudden they go into their classrooms and read about it and it starts to have, be a life-changing thing, you know, getting kids ready for you know, you know, action related to climate and the environment. So before I go into these then, I think I'll just stop there and see if you, have, if you might have questions. And I think that's probably a better way to go. Yeah, there, I mean, Tony, this is so incredible. And of course, everybody's always so inspired hearing from you and all the amazing work you've been doing. Um, a couple just like really big picture questions. Somebody asked, have you ever written about how like this up as a case study? And if so, is it possible to find like your journey in sustainability at the school district? Yeah, I, I recently there's an article that, um, that the Green Schools National Network published that I wrote uh, on that sort of covers a lot of this. Um, so if you go to the Green Schools National Network, the Green Schools, uh, the, the spring quarterly, there's an article by me on, on it there. Great, so we'll, we'll get that into the chat box. And then there was a lot of like more technical questions, but some people asking questions, you know, like with, like for example, the, uh, oh gosh, where'd it go? The chat box moving so quickly. Um, has there ever been any damage due to sports equipments, like hitting the, the panels or the, that, those types of things that you've installed? No, they're super, they're super strong. Um, we've had baseballs land on them and they, think they don't break the solar panels. 
And any kind of, when you put in solar panels, and the, they're all covered by service agreements. So like, even if a truck backs into one or something like that, it's all covered by the company that puts them in. We've had zero problems. You have to have a maintenance agreement with these things. They have to be cleaned with deionized water twice a year to keep them clean. You can't just hose them off because it spots them. So, and then a company monitors the output to make sure that they're, out, they're giving the electricity that they're supposed to be giving. Great. Um, another question came through just like, you know, you're coming to an end here. Um, what, what do you still wish, what is your next, your hope for them to do next in the, in the work at the school district? So the, the main focus should be again on instruction. I don't think you can ever get reach the end there. Um, I can't get the, the teachers en enough outside and on field trips. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat box, a little link to a project that I did. I became a certified naturalist this year. So one of the things I did is a project that I did on just walking the kids through the natural creek beds here and identifying the plants. And then I got a couple of high school kids to take our drone and fly it over the area with some music just to get the teachers inspired. I'll put that link in, you know, and, um, and so that kind of stuff, you know, that, that brought kids outside this year when they couldn't really go outside or they were inspired then to go outside because they could now identify some of the plants. I challenged them to do a project, to do some uh, nature drawing and send it in to me and we would post it on the website. So I only got a couple from kids, which I thought was unfortunate, but when it's more organized, that's something that more, more of them can do more of. And now I've got, I do have principals and teachers starting to take kids more on local hikes. I think our high school, for example, should have a mountain biking class because we have trails all over the place. They could just ride them. I said, I will buy you a set of mountain bikes. You know, we can afford them. If you will take the kids out, no one's taken me up on that offer yet. You know, so it's like leading from this side is unusual in schools. It's usually the other way around where you're trying to get the superintendent to convince them to do this kind of stuff and the board here, it's the opposite. You know, I can't get teachers to do enough of these kinds of things that I think are really cool. And um, so, but we're trying to, hopefully we're hiring teachers and administrators that will find this stuff exciting and will carry it well beyond myself, which I think we've, we've done. Incredible. Well, thank you for your innovation, innovative leadership. It's just been so awesome to see this. Uh, Sharon, I wanna turn it back over to you maybe. Sure. Thank you so much, Tony, for sharing your work. It's just incredible and so inspiring and, and wonderful to see all the images and all the all the things you've been doing for such a long time and all the new innovations and the new COVID adaptations that you've done. I'm just thrilled to see it all and, and would love to gather um, gather this video with other things you've mentioned and, and spotlight it on our, our website if you're able to, because I know that many more people would love to see it too. Well, um, so thank you. It's really important to know it. If we learn from each other, like I learned so much from you and from Yalda, who happened to be on the same presentation, and they, and then from Tim, I think he was on here too, and, and then Sadia's. I mean, we learn from each other, and that's how we keep keep this going. So thank you for putting this all together in a forum like this. It's awesome. Sure. And, and thank you so much for your work this year with the National Initiative and for joining us today. Let's give Tony a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to um, to give hand the virtual mic uh, over to Dr. Tim Baird, who is a retired superintendent of Encinitas Union School District, to say a few words. Hi, thank you, Sharon. Um, so, you know, after 42 years in public education, 39 of them spent in Oak Park and 17 as the superintendent, Tony is retiring. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been friends and colleague with Tony for around 20 years now. I first met Tony when I came to the Ventura County area. I was the assistant superintendent in Ojai. Tony was assistant superintendent in Oak Park. We're kind of at opposite ends of the county, but similar schools. So I started paying attention to what Tony was doing right away. A few years later, we both became superintendents of those respective districts and continue just to learn from Tony. Um, you know, Oak Park is a special place if you've not been to visit his district. It's a very high performing school district. One of those places where a superintendent could just sit back and say, hey, look at our high test scores. Tony never did that. You know, this has always been about the student, about the student as, as a whole child. And so they've been doing social emotional learning forever. They've been doing so many things where they really expand the learning for all students. Um, one of the things I learned from Tony early on, he became a district of choice so that he could bring more students in, diversified his district, expanded his district. We did that in Ojai. So I, I've been following Tony for a long time and getting lots of good ideas from him. 
Obviously, one of the biggest impacts has been in environmental programs. For those of you that don't know Tony, he's an environmentalist, has been himself for a long, long time. If you ever go to a statewide superintendent banquet, Tony brings his own plant-based food in his own, you know, reusable containers. And that's just who Tony is. He's got uh, electric vehicles. He's got solar. You know, Tony's been an environmentalist forever. But bringing that to a school district has been very special. And so, as mentioned, he was the first district in uh, California in 2013 to become a California Green Ribbon School District, then went on to become a U.S. Green Ribbon School District. So because of that, we had to copy him in Encinitas. We became the second one, again, learning from Tony all along. We joined Cali together around the same time, I think about five years ago. That's the California Environmental Literacy Initiative. Tony always brought a district perspective to that work and to everything he's been on. So this is how it impacts real school districts. He's always been one to share the work that he's doing and to work with others. And I've just enjoyed that. We've, we've presented together and done various things. He helped on the uh, COVID-19 National Outdoor Learning Policy Panel. So again, Tony's been willing to give up himself and his time for lots of causes over time. You know, at his core, Tony is a teacher, uh, still works with students. You probably heard that at the end there. He takes them out on field trips. He does science lessons, um, loves to interact with students. So I know I've got to wrap up, but when, when I grow up, I want to be Tony Knight. I, you know, this is an amazing educator. Congratulations to retirement, Tony. Um, I look forward to working with you on many projects still to come. That was, that was a nice surprise. Thank you very much, Tim. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much for all those very kind words and, and for all the flattery that's much undeserved. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, for, Tim, for sharing that. And, and congratulations on your retirement, Tony. And uh, we, we all wish you the best on your next set of adventures. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And so now I'd like to, to pass the mic to, to Andrea Yugoyan, who has been co-leading this, this uh, community practice with me for this is our 28th meeting um, and it's it's her final one as a co-leader so we also want to thank andra for her amazing and wonderful work and and send her appreciation for for that collaboration and yeah. on that she's also a co-founder of the whole initiative um, and we've been working together for the whole year so, so well thank, thank you so much sharon it's been such a pleasure i just wanted to thank the entire community for sticking with us all the way through it's been such a great learning journey for me to see how everybody can respond in a crisis and make like miracles happen really and really bring forward um, this incredible work and it's been such a pleasure learning from every single one of you so thank you for including me in the journey and it's been great and I look forward to continuing on to participate uh, with the National Outdoor Learning Initiative um, and staying in that seat of learner so thank you Sharon thank you for all your leadership thank you for all the great examples it's just been a real pleasure working with this whole um, this whole group.